Tonight, we have eight stories from stories involving hospitals, ghosts, demons, and much more. I'd like to give a huge thank you to the talented authors who allowed me to share these stories with you tonight. Remember, you can send in your own story to rylhstories at gmail.com. You can find it down in the description. I would love to share your story with everyone here. Likes and comments are always appreciated if you enjoy. Subscribing if you're new is as well. Enjoy the video. And as always, I hope you all have a great night. My name is Jane. I was a nurse. I used to work nights in the intensive care unit in a hospital downtown. How was it, you ask? My back hurt, the pay was good, and I could get seven days off at a time if I wanted to. But times have changed. I've changed. I don't really know what to do. I'm not a nurse anymore. Who am I now? I don't know. I wish it didn't happen. I wish a lot of things went differently. Well, it started off just like any other shift I've had in the hospital. I never really brought dinner with me, since eating a heavy meal in the middle of my shift would get me sleepy. Usually, I'll get a snack from the cafeteria vending machine in the basement. That night, it was about 2.30 a.m. when I asked my coworker Tasha if she wanted to get some chips with me. Sure, she said. But can you help me do my patient's baths when we get back? Yeah, no problem. I finished all of my baths already. I replied. We got other nurses to watch our patients while we're off the unit. We took the elevator to the basement, how we always do. Like I said, it was just like any other night. You know, you really have to stop listening to those horror podcasts. That way you won't be such a scaredy cat to go to the cafeteria alone at night. Tasha said as the elevator doors opened up to the basement. I laughed. I've never really seen you go down here by yourself either, Tasha. Tasha rolled her eyes. Whatever. A loud alarm sounded through the speakers, then a voice. Code met. Fourth floor. Room. And there was static. You see, as ICU nurses, if we're not busy, we usually go and help out with the codes in the other floors, especially at night. Code MET stood for Medical Emergency Team, meaning someone is doing really badly, and is basically in the process of dying. Did you hear what room the call was? I asked Tasha. I couldn't hear. The static was too loud. Not sure. It said the fourth floor, though. I'm sure if we come up there, we'll figure out what room it is, she said. It was going to be too many flights of stairs to climb, so we decided to take the elevator up. It was nighttime, so they were usually free. We were waiting for the doors to open up when the lights started flickering in the basement. A power outage? Tasha asked. I don't know. Something doesn't feel right. I said as I felt the tiny hairs on my arms go up in a shiver. Stop trying to scare me, Tasha said as she ran her hands over her shoulders, as if she felt a cold breeze too. This elevator is taking too long. Maybe we should just try the stairs. Then the elevator dinged. The lights in the basement returned to the normal just as the elevator doors opened up. A man was in the corner of the elevator, tall, dark-haired, and maybe in his early 40s. He was wearing a hospital gown. He looked shocked and afraid, like a deer caught in headlights. I'm sure Tasha and I mirrored his expression. We stared at one another for what felt like forever until the man spoke up. This is my room? He asked. Tasha and I looked at each other, and I saw relief wash over in her eyes. I thought that he was just a confused patient. I've dealt with so many confused patients from the past. He probably wandered off outside his room. I didn't think there was any reason to be afraid. Looking back, I should have known better. Unless someone was blocking it, the elevator doors never stayed open that long. Sir, can I ask you what your name is? Do you know what room you're supposed to be in? I asked him. He bent his head down. I... I don't remember. There were so many people running around. Some big commotion was happening. I slipped out, but then I got lost. I'm looking for my wife. He replied. Tasha asked him. Sir, can we look at your armband? We can try to get you back to your actual room. The man lifted his arm to her and she looked at it puzzlingly. It's so faded, all I can make out is his first name, and what I think is a four something for his room number, she said. Oh, he's probably talking about the code when he said there was a commotion. You're so smart, Tasha. Let's get him back. We've been off the unit for a while now. Mr. John, we're going to get you to the fourth floor and see if we can find your room there, Tasha said to the man, 
a reassuring smile on her face. We should have never gotten onto the elevator. I wish the nightmares would end. As soon as we got inside the elevator and the doors closed, the man started getting agitated. Do you know where my wife is? I've been looking for her. The man shouted. I tried my best to calm him down. Sir, we are going to get you back to your floor. When we get there, we can ask about your family, okay? I said, using my calm voice. I was afraid that he would become aggressive and lash out at us. I looked at the displays which shows the floor the elevator is on. The button for the fourth floor was lit up, but the display still said B for basement. Tasha and I had our backs to the elevator doors. I looked at her and shook my head. The man started laughing maniacally, louder and louder, his voice getting deeper and deeper. <laughs> you think you could get away from me? He ran towards me. Both arms stretched out to grab my neck, a deranged look on his face. I screamed and closed my eyes, thinking that the man was going to snap my neck and kill me. I was wrong. I opened my eyes to the man grabbing Tasha's throat, her feet hanging in the air. I could hear her soft whimpers as she struggled against him. He was so tall, his skin was pale and gray. But those eyes. His irises were black, and the whites of his eyes were red and bloodshot. His hands were bigger than Tasha's head. His nails dark and pointed. He opened his mouth to speak, and I could see his teeth, which were like a lion's, long and sharp. That man, that thing, was not human. You thought you could leave me, Mary. I gave you everything you have. You're nothing without me. He bellowed, his hands gripping tighter on Tasha's neck. Her cries were getting quieter and quieter, and her face increasingly becoming pale. I grabbed at the man's arms trying with all my strength to pull him away, but my efforts were in vain. Tasha was slowly slipping away from the world. I saw her eyes roll to the back of her skull. Her body was going limp against the monster. Get away from her! I yelled. You've made a mistake. She's not Mary. He laughed again, rolling his head back in glee. He shook his head and dropped Tasha to the floor. He stepped towards me and put both his giant palms on either side of my face, squeezing hard. It felt like my eyes were about to painfully pop out of my head. He was saying something when he suddenly let go of my face. He stepped back, clutching his arms around his chest. Then he started to shake against the back wall of the elevator, as if he was having a seizure. Mary, I mean Tasha, was lying still on the floor. Unconscious, but thankfully, alive and breathing. The man, the creature, looked at me, his eyes searching his intense stare reaching for something deep within me. I opened my mouth to speak. Then, the elevator dinged. I don't really remember much of what happened that night after the elevators finally opened up to the fourth floor. The creature was gone, and Tasha stood up beside me with tears running down her face. Apparently there was no patient that was unaccounted for on their floor. The person they were coding was successfully revived. He was transferred to the ICU. Tasha and I went back to our patients, it was as if nothing happened. Neither of us spoke to each other for the rest of the night. I think we were both afraid that, if we said anything, it would confirm that he, it, was real. The rest of the shift was uneventful. I was relieved to think I had seven days off after my shift was over. I needed a break from the hospital, but I didn't get much rest after that. Whenever I slept, I dreamt of those dark, bloodshot eyes, looking for me through the depths of darkness. After a few days, Tasha left town. She texted me that she broke up with her boyfriend and that she needed to spend time with her parents back at her hometown. Then, she told me to be careful and to not go down to the basement cafeteria from now on. My first shift back, I felt okay. I was ready to put what happened that night behind me. I was a professional. This was my career. I couldn't let something stupid, which was probably a hallucination, stop me from doing my job. I was getting bedside report from the day shift nurse. This is Mr. Andrews. He was a MET call last week from the fourth floor. He had an MI encoded. He got resuscitated, intubated, and transferred down here. He's off the vent. His wife is at his bedside. We walked into the room, and I introduced myself as I was looking over the patient's chart. Hi, my name is Jane, and I'll be your nurse for tonight. I looked up. I saw those same eyes, the ones that have been haunting me since that night, always following, always searching. I wouldn't, couldn't, forget. The man in front of me was normal, his eyes were normal, 
compared to that creature's, but I knew. I knew they were the same. Hi, my name's John, and this is my wife, Mary. Nice to meet you, Jane. I looked at the wife, her breath caught in my throat. I suddenly remembered a distant memory from a year ago. Without thinking, I stepped forward to John, my patient. I leaned over to his bed, reached out, and I... I grabbed his neck with both of my hands. I squeezed as tightly as I could, while he gasped for air under my grip. There were people screaming for help. I couldn't help but smile as I attempted to crush his neck. His hands clung away at my arms. In the end, I couldn't stop myself, and I had no desire to. You see, I remember that about a year before, around the same time, Tasha and I went out for coffee. I made fun of Tasha because she showed up wearing a turtleneck in the middle of summer. I'm anemic, okay? I get cold easily, Tasha said to me, tugging up at her collar. Well, I laughed at her outfit. You see, that day, I saw John's wife sitting at a chair next to his bed. She was wearing a thick gray scarf around her neck in the middle of summer. And I remember the last thing the creature said before he disappeared that night. She's just another Mary. Last year, I went to stay with my grandmother in the countryside. She lives in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere in Scotland. My grandfather has recently passed away after battling a long illness. Years of being a smoker had caught up with him, even though he had quit a long time ago. I was worried she might be lonely, so I went to stay for a while. As I said, she lives in the middle of nowhere in a tiny village, so socializing isn't a big thing, and I don't get to see her very often. One night there, it was perhaps 1 a.m., I couldn't sleep so I was on my laptop in the guest bedroom that had formerly belonged to my grandfather. It had new furniture, etc. to make it a guest bedroom, as his hospital bed and all the things he had needed were taken back. Honestly, it was quite a nice guest bedroom. Homey. Though I did not like how close the window was to the bed. I live on a second story flat, so I'm not used to having ground floor windows that close to my head as I rest. As I'm on my laptop, I heard what sounds like a flock of chickens going by the window. Going nuts, clucking and making noise. I thought nothing of this, and even chuckled to myself thinking the neighbor's chickens had gotten out, as a little man across the street has a coop. I'm about to go check the window, thinking if it is, I'll put food out and try to herd them into the garden so they can stay in one area and not get lost. Before I reach the window, however... The noise of chickens changes and begins to blend together into a noise that gets louder and louder until it doesn't sound like chickens anymore. It sounds like a screaming that has me frozen in place. It no longer sounded like multiple voices of an animal, so I knew it wasn't a flock of chickens being attacked by a fox or something. And I grew up in Scotland. I am very aware of how foxes, owls, and other animals sound in the night. It was something I had never heard before. It was now a hellish screaming noise that was directly at my window, which was thankfully covered by curtains, though the light was on, and curtains no doubt were lit up. It stayed at my window for perhaps five, maybe ten minutes, while I'm frozen from fear in the middle of the room, unable to so much as twitch a muscle in fear, before it left, and I could hear the screaming get more and more distant until it was gone. I have no idea what I heard, and was too scared to talk to my grandmother about it the next day. I haven't heard it since then in my visits. I will say this, whatever it was making those sounds, I felt in my bones that was trying to make me come out, to lure me out to the window or outside, and I knew instinctively, if I had moved from that spot, that would have likely been the end. I am certain to always turn the room lights out early now, even if I do not sleep. I live in an apartment complex where everyone has a shared garbage room. It was a brand new building when I moved in about one year ago, and everything was and still is pretty spotless, much thanks to the building janitor. I see him mostly in the mornings, cleaning and tidying and doing various things on the ground floor by the entrance. He does have a routine which slightly annoys me though. Every day when I leave for work, he's in the garbage room, making sure everything is sorted correctly as our buildings have separate boxes and containers depending on what you throw out. Recyclables must be separate, cans, plastic bottles, and so forth. What started to annoy me started to happen about a month ago. 
I had the habit of bringing down my garbage in the mornings, and whenever I entered the garbage room, the building janitor would be there, sitting on his knees, going through various garbage from each container, where people throw their stuff. He'd smile and reach out with his open hand exclaiming in a cheerful voice, Oh, good morning, sir. Please let me handle that. I would leave right after, but lately, I would get a strange feeling that he would go through my garbage, perhaps finding something which I misplaced, or worse, something personal. It is the trash after all, and some things I don't want anybody to handle. I would never see him actually going through anyone's garbage bag, so it was more of an unfounded suspicion stuck in my head. So, this led me to changing my routine, throwing away my garbage late in the evenings. I would go downstairs around 11pm, if I had accumulated enough garbage, and I hardly ever saw anyone on my way down there. The garbage room is a long, kind of oblong rectangular room, with an always locked door leading outside in the far end. On either side there are large doors, kind of heavy set which makes a screeching noise when opened. Inside each door is a box or container where you're supposed to put whatever you're throwing away. In each container there is a label, so you don't mix things up. Each space is fairly large. Imagine a closet, but taller, and deep enough to fit a couple of medium-sized garbage bags. One shelf divided the bottom and top part. All was going well until two days ago. I had held off throwing away my garbage for a couple of days for reasons I can't remember, and had accumulated two small bags of recyclables, three plastic bottles, and a large tin can. When I checked the time, it had already passed 11.30pm, but since everything is inside the building, there is no need to put on heavy clothes for the outside. And because it's February, it's still very chilly. Looking outside the window, I noticed it was windy as well. I took the elevator down and walked to the door to the garbage room. The garbage room has no light switch, but instead, a motion sensor which turns on the light automatically as soon as you open the door. As I opened the door, I stopped by the threshold expecting the light to turn on. Nothing. I put down the two bags I had in one hand in order to wave it in front of the sensor, which is installed just above the door. <laughs> Let there be light. The light turned on, the bright light making me squint for just a second, but within that second, I thought I saw someone or something in the far corner of the room. My eyes quickly focused on the corner, yet nothing was there. I'm not a superstitious guy. Moving on, I entered, picked up the two bags I put on the floor to approach the closet door for recyclables, as I put my hand on the small steel handle to open. A strange thought entered my vision. Something was behind this door. It wasn't just a feeling, it was a certainty I just couldn't shake away. I must have stood there for a minute. Slowly I turned the handle and peeked inside. Garbage. Nothing there but garbage. It stank, but not overwhelmingly so. It's a garbage room after all. I gave a sigh and threw in the two bags with a smirk. I'm just imagining things. It's late, and I'm tired, I told myself. Closing the door a moment later, I went to the door on the opposite side which is for the plastic bottles. The thought of something behind the door couldn't be shaken away though, and I hesitated for a moment before opening the other door. As I opened it, I swear I could hear a sound coming from behind me. I froze for a second, looked back at the door I had just closed. Did I just hear something? Waiting, my ears at attention. No, nothing there, I thought. Getting more unnerved by the second, I threw the plastic bottles into the box with the other bottles and quickly closed the door. Just the tin can left. It's the door closest to the far end of the room. Feeling a sudden haste to finish and get the hell out of there, I took long but quick strides towards the end of the room, and as I reached out for the handle, I heard it. It was like a low whisper yet still audible. It couldn't come from something human. It's hard to describe but it's the type of sound I would imagine a disembodied voice would sound like. It came from the first door which led to the recyclables, where I had just thrown the two bags of garbage into. A deep, dark sound. It was like someone was trying to gurgle with gravy. Now I was really scared, throwing the tin can into the box, not caring about anything else but to get the hell out of Dodge. I went for the closest door, which is the door leading outside. It was locked. I quickly turned around and the door at the other end of the room looked like it could be a mile away. Listening for any other sound or movement, I started to take very slow steps, basically hugging the opposite side to where the door from which the sound had originated. Slowly, trying to not make a sound, I could feel myself getting closer to the exit, but the door with the sound was also getting closer. Another step and I was right in front of it. 
I was suddenly thrust into darkness. I almost yelled out in surprise, but managed to keep my mouth shut, though I had no control over my breathing, which to me sounded like a hurricane in my head. I tried to wave my hands high up, but the darkness remained. Not two seconds later, I heard another sound which almost made me pee my pants. It was the unmistakable sound of the door handle turning. To hell with this, I thought, and sprinted to the exit, opened it like it was paper, and threw myself outside towards the lit corridor and safety. Almost crashing headfirst into the wall on the opposite side, I don't even remember taking the steps towards the elevator, pushing the button to my floor, getting to my floor, and entering my apartment. I do remember one thing. As the door to the garbage room was closing behind me, I had seen something in the corner of my vision. At the foot of the closing door was a set of eyes peering at me through the darkness. Red, glowing eyes. I think I'll throw away my garbage in the mornings from now on. At least until I can find a new apartment. I tried posting this somewhere else, but people didn't believe me. Hopefully you will. I've always been into spooky things. Halloween was my favorite holiday. I lived for the Halloween specials on Teletoon and Disney Channel. My grandmother handmade my costumes, and I would wear them year-round. When Michael's craft store finally released their Halloween stock in August, you could bet that I'd be there on an afternoon off, spending borderline ridiculous amounts of time inspecting the Halloween Town displays. Did I believe in ghosts? Yes and no. I feel like most people have this relationship with the supernatural. The child within them wishes that these things were true. That spooky scary skeletons danced in cemeteries after hours. And that ghosts got a kick out of scaring the pants off unsuspecting humans. While we like to imagine that the world and its wonders were curated by the mind of Walt Disney, what happens when something actually does go bump in the night and you're there to hear it? Immediately, we jump to the most logical explanation. We say it was the wind. It was a short circuit. It was a pipe bursting. Anything other than the possibility that what you saw cannot be explained by science or reason, because that's the most terrifying thing of all, the not knowing. That's why when my mother told me she thought she was sensitive to spirits, you could hardly blame me for being skeptical. She told me that the night my great-grandmother died, she saw a shadow that resembled her rummaging through plastic bags and hover over us while we were sleeping. Her cane was found at the front door the next morning. That conversation ended with me saying something about science and reason, and that was the end of that. Every so often, mom would tell her friends about some spooky encounter, and I usually rolled my eyes or tried to offer a less fantastical explanation. I was usually deemed a buzzkill, but I didn't mind that much. I'm a little more open-minded now compared to back then. A few summers ago, I was working at a sleepaway camp. It was a lot of fun and a glad retreat from the monotony of university and work. I had the youngest group every year since I began working, and this year was no different. Well, it was a massive compliment to me that they thought I was great with the younger kids. Staying up with them nights after night because they missed their mom could get old pretty fast. The night of the incident began like every other night at camp. After calming the last of the kids and humming them to sleep, I left the room of snoring little humans to get myself ready for Ben. I was the only counselor in the cabin. The senior counselors usually hung around after the meeting to smoke cigarettes and chat at the administrative cabin well into the night, but I figured that the junior counselors in my cabin needed a night off. I went back early to relieve them. I was tired anyways, so I didn't particularly mind skipping a night of shenanigans with my friends. I hit my bed and fell asleep with the same minute. You know that feeling when someone stares at you and you can feel it on the back of your neck? Then you turn around and, sure enough, you lock eyes with the person doing the creeping. This sensation was exactly what awoke me. I wasn't surprised or scared. In fact, I was expecting it. One of my friends was on their last two cigarettes, and I was a consistent smoker who could always be counted on to have a spare pack on me. The counselor's room was separate from the camper's room, and so we often visited each other's cabins if we needed something without fear of waking the kids. We were all close enough friends that we could just walk in and ask. I was distinctly aware of someone standing over me, and I sighed without looking. I knew they needed smoke, so I opened my mouth and eyes to tell them where my pack was and to tell them to quickly screw off and let me sleep. My voice never came out. Now I'm aware that this could have been the result of waking up from REM sleep, 
It could have been my exhaustion, finally taking its toll on me, but I can feel it in my bones. This was real. Hovering inches from my face was a black mass. I can only describe it as fizzy, as though television static had stepped out of its electronic confines and manifested in a humanoid figure. I stared up on blinking at it, let myself fully wake up, and it was still there. Strangely, I wasn't scared. Be it shock or confusion, I don't know. Probably both. It was freezing, especially for July. It was dead silent too. As though even the crickets were holding their breaths. Bathing the room around me in red was the emergency exit light above the door on the other end of the room. The man whose features I couldn't make out was leaning over my face. After an unbearable silence that felt like minutes, even though it was likely only a few seconds, the figure stood straight, its head practically touching the ceiling. I watched it move back, as though it were standing on a carpet being dragged backwards. It never turned away from me. It melted into the one dark corner of the room, and it was gone. I stared at the spot for a length of time I couldn't accurately recall. I felt nothing. I just stared. I don't think I was even breathing the entire time. Finally, sound returned to me. I could hear my counselor roommate stomping up the front steps of the cabin and walk in, coming to my bedside to quietly ask if I had any cigarettes left. I wrote the entire thing off the next morning. I was more tired that morning than any other morning, even though I had gotten considerably more sleep and downed significantly more coffee than my co-counselors at breakfast. I even napped with the kids at nap time. I told my co-counselor, and to my chagrin, she enthusiastically believed me. Others too. Now, had I left camp after just this, it would still have been a write-off experience to me. Imagine my dismay when I saw it again in the hall during a late night bathroom visit later that week. I immediately turned on my heel and marched back to my room. I couldn't hold it until morning. Once again within range of Wi-Fi signal, I immediately began researching shadow people. Most of what I was reading matched up with what I had experienced. I searched for any sort of logical explanation for the manifestation of shadow people, and I believed what I read. But something in my guts couldn't truly accept it. Finally, I confided in my mother. She was rapturous in her response, either overjoyed by the fact that I finally saw something like she could, or that I would finally stop chastising her for telling people she saw ghosts. Every now and then, I'll catch a glimpse of a fizzy figure out of the corner of my eye. Or I walk into a place and immediately be filled with dread while everyone else is fine. My friends whom I've told are all for it, and often bring up what they call my psychic abilities. I'm not a psychic. I'm not a medium. But I do have many, many questions. I'm not crazy, am I? Do you think you could give me a ride home? It was that innocent and seemingly innocuous question that damn near brought me to death's doorstep. It wasn't a hitchhiker on the side of the road, or a straggler outside of a gas station. It was a stranger, sure, but it was one who was fairly close to my circle of friends, and I never saw it coming. My best friend always told me that my kindness would be the death of me. I've forgiven cheating ex-boyfriends, abusive friends, and betraying family members. I've given friends rides to and from, and I've stayed up all night to talk to an acquaintance out of suicide. I ordered a pizza for someone who just lost their job and couldn't afford a meal. I was always blessed growing up, and one day, finally having realized the magnitude of my blessings, decided to start paying it forward whenever I was physically and financially able. The incident occurred about four or five years ago on a quiet Friday night. I'd opted for a night's in with Netflix and snacks rather than going out for drinks and karaoke. I was living with my parents at the time, and my mother was visiting my grandmother, so it was just my father, the pets, and I in the house. I found myself curled up in bed having a little Guy Ritchie marathon, since my dad was brought out on the couch watching some classic Batman films from the golden era. I was about 20 minutes into lock, stock, and two smoking barrels, when I heard the familiar sound of a Facebook Messenger notification chiming on my phone. I reached over and opened the message, seeing it was from someone I knew of, but had never actually met before. His name was Alan. We had a moderate handful of mutual friends, and despite never seeing him before in my life, I had accepted the friend request he'd sent a few weeks back. He seemed to talk to some people I knew on a regular basis, so I figured he just wanted to expand his circle. He 
He posted some rather funny memes and the often relatable millennial joke posts here and there. I'd never actually talked to him before, but we've mutually liked each other's content. I was a little surprised to actually receive a message from him, especially around 10pm on a random Friday night. Hey. Simple and innocent enough, I supposed. Hey man, how's it going? I replied, keeping it chill and casual, plopping my phone back on the bed and resuming my movie. He responded almost immediately. Good. Hey, listen. I'm at my friend's house and everyone is drunk and shit. Do you think you could give me a ride home? Weird. I literally didn't know this guy whatsoever. Other than having mutual friends and completely out of the blue, he messages me, of all people, to ask for a ride. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little annoyed at the idea of having to leave the house, but more so for someone who'd have that audacity, for lack of a better word to ask me to. On the other hand, it was kind of late and fairly cold outside. Buses had already stopped running, Uber and Lyft weren't a thing in my town back then, and getting a taxi could be expensive. Where are you? 55 Spring Road. I live at 93 Juliet Street. With a quick search on Apple Maps, I saw that he wasn't too far away, and surprisingly, lived a couple of miles north of me. I figured it wouldn't take all that long to do him the favor, and at least he wouldn't have to walk in the cold or get a ride from someone who'd been drinking and endanger both of their lives. Give me a few minutes to get dressed, and I'll let you know when I'm there. Awesome, thanks. I had a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach, but I was diagnosed with anxiety, and it always made a point to resurface when it came to meeting someone new. I threw on a pair of jeans and a hoodie, slipped into my going wherever I need shoes, pair of sneakers, and collected my wallet, phone, and keys before heading into the living room to announce my departure. Despite being an adult, I always made a point out of mutual respect to inform my parents where I was going and for what reason. As I climbed into the cabin of my SUV, the feeling in my stomach grew stronger, and I couldn't figure out why my internal monologue was telling me to abort mission, go back upstairs, ignore any messages Alan sent, and apologize in the morning saying I fell asleep. I shook the thought and started the commute. When I pulled up to the house and parked across the street, I noticed that the only source of light was coming from one of the windows on the third floor. Even with my windows closed, I could hear the unmistakable sound of drunken youthful banter. I messaged Alan to let him know I arrived and a moment later, a figure appeared in the window and seemed to be looking down at me. In that moment, I was thankful that my windows were tinted as dark as legally possible, so there was no way whoever that was could have seen me staring back, trying to make out his features. A few moments went by before Alan finally responded saying he was on his way down but the man at the window hadn't moved a muscle whatsoever. Eventually the front door opened and there was Alan, easily recognizable in the now illuminated porch light, probably motion sensors, looking exactly like he does in his Facebook pictures. He hopped down the steps, backpack over his shoulder, and made his way over to me, having been inside the only vehicle on the street with its headlights on. He opened the door and climbed into the passenger seat, dropping his backpack between his feet. He greeted me with an oddly enthusiastic hello and leaned over to give me a hug. Weird, but my masculinity isn't so fragile. As to decline a hug from another guy. I started to drive off and glanced up at the third floor window again to find the man still watching. The flight or fight feeling in my stomach came back twice as hard. Thanks for the ride, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, I replied, forcing a smile. I kept the radio at a low volume and kept an eye on Alan in my peripheral vision. He would occasionally look out of the window, glance at me, and go back to the window. His right leg was bouncing up and down, as if he was nervous about something, and I noticed he kept scratching his thigh. In hindsight, they were obvious signs of nervousness or anxiety, but I had no idea why at the present moment. A nice car, by the way. What is it? A brand new X5? I nodded. Yeah, it is. I just got it a few months ago. Alan whistled. Damn, must have been expensive. I didn't acknowledge the question. There was something about his tone and the implication of the statement that rubbed me the wrong way. It wasn't unusual for people to question the cost of the BMW, but there was something about how he said it that made me think he'd drive off in it given the opportunity. I really wanted to ask him why he reached out to me, of all people, to give him a ride home, but I kept my mouth shut for a majority of the ride. His presence made me incredibly uncomfortable and I couldn't wait to get him home and get myself home. I really appreciate you doing this, man, he said, breaking the silence. I really didn't want to have to walk home. It's cool, no worries. 
Do you do this often? He laughed. Give rides to strangers, I mean. I shook my head. Not usually, no. Alan laughed again, probably for the best. You know, there's a lot of crazies out here. He said in a dramatic, Joker-esque, sing-song manner. It made my stomach turn. Without skipping a beat, I retorted, Yeah, you're right. That's why I keep a gun under my seat. You never know. I looked up at him in my peripheral vision, and his expression was emotionless. He looked out of the window, and remained quiet the entire remainder of the ride, and didn't look back at me once. As I neared his neighborhood, he pointed out an empty spot a few houses down from his. You can just drop me off here, man. It's cool, he said hurriedly. I obliged and threw the SUV in park. Ellen immediately collected his backpack, said a quick thanks, and practically power walked toward his house, disappearing into the driveway. I immediately shifted into gear and hightailed it home. The moment I left his neighborhood, I felt this overwhelming sense of relief. I don't think he caught on that I was bluffing about having a gun under the seat, but something tells me that the comment deterred him from whatever it was he originally planned to do. A few weeks later, I came home from work and my parents were watching the news. Alan's mugshot was on channel 6. He was arrested for brutally murdering a girl in our town after she'd picked him up and gave him a ride home. The girl, Allison, left her Facebook logged in on her laptop and her mother checked it when Allison wasn't responding to text messages or phone calls. The police went to Allison's house and found Allison's gray Toyota with her body in the trunk. Allen was arrested immediately with Allison's blood on his clothes and his hands. Inside Allison's car on the passenger side was Alan's backpack, which contained miscellaneous drugs and a bloody machete. I went to the bathroom and barely made it before I vomited. My entire life flashed before my eyes as I was collapsed over the toilet. I didn't dare tell my parents that he was the friend I gave a ride to a few weeks prior. I did send an anonymous tip to the police about the occupants of the third floor apartment of 55 Spring Road which led to the arrest of a handful of men and a collection of controlled substances. I can't say what would have happened to me if I didn't lie to Alan about having a gun under the seat of my car. What I can say is the fact that since that night, I do carry a gun now, and I've never given a ride to anyone I didn't personally know. Okay, so this took place a few days ago. My friend and I were reminiscing about old spots we used to smoke at as teenagers. We remembered an old, abandoned paper mill that we would frequently visit. Unfortunately, after years of stoners trespassing and getting into mischief, the security by the front entrance was a new issue. We discovered a new entrance though. At the nearest high school, there's a gravel pathway that leads to a fenced off area. All you have to do is hop that fence, walk down the path some more that leads to some woods, down some steep hills and you can enter through the back of the paper mill. My buddy, let's call him Danny, and I drove to the high school, hopped the fence, and made our way down. At this point, the sun was quickly descending, so we knew we wouldn't be visible to any cops near the front area of the property. As we get down, nostalgia kicks in, and we were amazed to see that nothing had changed a bit. We walk around, take in the sights, and walk inside one of the hollowed out silos. Danny and I always love to sing in this silo, since the acoustics in there are phenomenal. We sing, and after about five minutes, Danny turns to me and says, Did you hear that? We pause and wait for the echoing of our singing voices to stop. I told him I didn't hear anything, and he said we should probably get going. At first, I was confused, but I figured he was just getting spooked because the sun was fully set now, and we were in an abandoned place. We make our way out of the silo, and immediately we are taken aback by how eerily silent it had gotten. No cars driving by near the front. No birds. Nothing. We make our way back, and before too long, I start to get a little paranoid. Right as I'm about to mention something to Danny, he says, Holy shit. I turn to him and he's looking up at one of the old industrial structures. I look to where he's looking, and I kid you not, at the top there are five figures lined up staring down at us. Words can't even describe the ice cold feeling that ran through my body as I saw this. I immediately felt like I was going to puke. I had never felt anything close to the amount of fear that I felt in that moment. Before I could even think, Danny screamed run, and we hightailed it back the way we came as fast as we possibly could without looking back. Sprinting back up those steep hills was one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. We kept thinking we heard footsteps behind us, but we didn't have the courage to check. We just kept running, the fear never dying down. 
Eventually, we reached the top, hopped the fence in record speed, and kept running until we reached the parking lot. Before I could make it to my car, however, I collapsed and vomited. I'm sure the five minute straights of sprinting helped, but the fear that was still consuming me made me dry heave again, and again until my stomach throbbed with pain. Danny, trying not to hurl himself, pleaded with me to get up and unlock the car, which I eventually did after stumbling over my own bile. After starting up the car and locking the doors, I started to break down. Tears streamed down my cheeks as we made our way out of the high school parking lot. Danny tried to fight them back, but the tears started falling from his eyes as well. We had both just experienced something that you only hear about in fictional tales, horror movies. As we were driving, I asked Danny what made him look over in that direction in the first place. What he told me almost made me throw up again. He told me that when we were in the silo, he could swear that he heard another deeper voice amongst ours, as well as some keys jingling. He said he shrugged it off when we left, but felt as if there were eyes on us. He scanned the surrounding area, and as he was looking around, he heard what sounded like muttering from the opposite direction he was looking. This is where shit gets really freaky. He told me he saw about 15 silhouettes lining the top of the structure, staring. No discernible features, just a mob of shadow staring. I told him I'd only seen five figures when I looked up, and he swore up and down that he saw more than ten of them, and not started to form in my stomach as even more questions were popping into my head. Why did he see more? Why did I see less? What even were those things? Why did he hear another voice in the silo? What was with the jingling keys? My head started to spin, and now all I wanted to do was be back at my own house. I made sure to take the long route home, purposely avoiding driving in front of that godforsaken place. After speeding a majority of the way, we finally made it back to my home and didn't tell any of this to my parents. How could I? What could I even say? Needless to say, both of us are still really shaken up and have had problems sleeping since. We decided that we are never, ever going anywhere near that paper mill again for as long as we live. Maybe some memories are best left as memories, after all. Before anyone says anything, I know I shouldn't be telling you all this because the information was never made public, but in my defense, this was a while back and I doubt anyone I worked with originally is left at the Marlin County Sheriff's Department. Besides, some stories just need to be told, you know? And I feel like letting this fade into the forgotten past would be wrong to the folks who died. And it could also be that someone out there might have an idea as to what exactly the hell happened on that night in August. It was 1986 specifically. A week after the Edmond post office shooting, I think it was because of this that the story never traveled beyond a brief mention on the local radio, but it could very well have just been just one of those weeks where news doesn't stick for some reason or another. I was newly deputized at the time, and had just finished celebrating my 27th birthday and my 5th wedding anniversary. Things had been slow around town and the surrounding countryside, but I recall there being some sense of unease almost as if we knew that something was coming. I was late on the scene after I received the call because I had been settling a domestic dispute on the other side of the forest between some husband and wife. The place where it happened was an old diner just off the highway, nearby a long stretch of logging road that had been unused for many years. By the time I got there, Sheriff Bragg and Wilson, my fellow deputy, were already on the scene along with some state police. I remember Wilson caught me in the parking lot on my way to the diner doors and grabbed my arm to halt me. Steal yourself, Gordon, he advised. I think I asked him why and all I got in return was a, you have to see it for yourself. He was right. I honestly don't know how he could have possibly articulated what awaited me inside that place. There were seven bodies in total, five locals who frequented the diner, some on a daily basis a waitress named Peggy who lived in town, and the diner's own John Higgins. Each of them had been shot dead with an old antique Winchester Model 1897 shotgun that was found a few feet from John's body on the floor. From the initial evidence, it appeared that the shooting had been carried out by John, a fact that we would later confirm when we watched the security tape. While that was certainly bizarre given that John was known to be a kindly pillar of the community, it wasn't the strangest thing about the scene. No, the weird part was the drawings on each of the tabletops. They were children's drawings. The sort that you might find on any proud parent's refrigerator. 
Animals mostly, with some houses, smiling suns and stars, that kind of thing. But these drawings were also illustrated using the blood of the victims. Now when I say every tabletop, I mean all 24 tables, completely covered in these blood drawings. Even more uncomfortable than I felt when I looked at the bodies. There was something truly malevolent about them, in a way that I can't put my finger on even today. Even given what I know now. After we wrapped up our duties as the local outfit and left the rest of the state police, we returned to the station to review the security tape for the diner that day. At first, things appeared to be totally normal with light morning traffic for breakfast. That was until Wilson pointed out that a small family had been sitting at the same table for over an hour without ordering anything or even moving. The family was like something out of a picture book, blonde, smiling, and dressed up like they'd just come from church. There was a man, woman, and a small girl with curly hair, and it wasn't just weird that they weren't ordering anything or talking to anyone, but the diner staff also didn't seem to realize they were there, as they just kept walking past them without even a glance. That was until John approached the table a little after noon. He exchanged brief words with the child, before she took John's hand and walked with him and the two adults that were with her out of the diner. One of the waitresses waved to John as he passed by, and he seemed to give a friendly nod, of head in response. After the dinner rush, all the waitresses left except Peggy, and the evening patrons rolled in one at a time. It was around 6 when John returned to the diner parking lot, where he sat in his old Chevy for 3 hours before moving into the diner with a shotgun. That was where the tape got a little fuzzy. We could see the muzzle flashes, but since the camera had no audio, we couldn't hear anything. Peggy was the last to die, as best as we could figure as she ran and hid in the back. We could see through the static John dragging her by her hair, from out of the office before shooting her in the head, just behind the counter. Then, he moved to the middle of the place, stuck the barrel of the gun in his mouth, and blew his own brains out. Now, here's where it gets really strange. No sooner had John's body hit the floor when the little girl shows up again at the door, only this time her curly hair is down and forward, obstructing her face from view. She approached John on the floor and seemed to clap and giggle, or seize up. Then she bent down and dipped her fingers in the blood on the floor, before getting to work drawing on the first table. At this point the tape was clear, but the timestamp in the corner began to change rapidly to all kinds of different numbers. Given the time that Sheriff Bragg and Wilson arrived with the state police after a nearby hitchhiker reported hearing the shots, the little girl should have still been there. On the tape, it took her six hours to finish up with each of the tables, but due to the defective timestamp, there's no real way to tell what time it was when she was done. The tape crapped out on us right around that time for a moment, which is why me and Wilson nearly fell out of our seats when the picture came through again. The little girl was standing over John's body, looking right up at the camera, only there was something wrong with her face. Her eyes were as small as buttons and as black as coal. Her nose was so flat, you almost couldn't call it a nose, but it was her mouth that really made my skin crawl. It was large and twisted into a malicious grin so wide that she almost looked like a cartoon character. She seemed to stare into the camera for an eternity before spinning around like a ballerina and skipping out of the diner. That was when the timestamp on the video changed to reflect the current time, 11 o'clock. Two minutes later on the footage, Sheriff Bragg and the state troopers burst through the door, and that was the end of that. Of course, we immediately rewound the footage as neither Wilson or I could believe what in the hell we'd just seen. But something happened to the tape then, and the VCR started smoking. When we were finally able to fish the tape out of the damn thing, it was melted beyond repair. So we were the only ones who ever got to see the footage. The revelation that John had committed the murders was an easy pill for the state to swallow, given the evidence found in the diner. But our statement regarding the girl and the two people that had been with her was dismissed as us seeing things on account of the long hours awake. Of course, they still have no reasonable explanation for those drawings on the tables. I quit my job not long after that. Hell, who wouldn't? We moved away, and are now living happily in retirement. But I do think about that case a lot. What the hell was that girl? What did her and the people she was with do to John to make him snap like that? Why did the tape self-destruct after Wilson and I watched it? So many questions, and not many answers, unfortunately. I just hope that's the last time I ever have to see that little evil monster's face again.
Last night, at 10.11pm, my mom received an international phone call from an unknown number. Assuming my brother, who is currently studying abroad, lost his phone and was calling from someone else's phone, she picked it up and put it on speaker for me and my dad to hear. The only thing we heard was as if the person calling was violently rubbing their clothes. My mom said hello several times, but got no verbal responses, so she hung up, thinking it could be some sort of mistake. Not even a minute later, at 10.12pm, the same number called again. The same thing happened, so my mom hung up. This time we were all a bit perplexed, if not freaked out. Two minutes later, at 10.14pm, just as we thought the number will never call again, it came, and the same thing happened. What happened next brought the situation to a whole new level of bizarre. A minute later, at 10.15pm, my dad's phone rang. It was the same number. My dad picked up and the same noise started, as if the person is frantically running or rubbing their clothes. We were sure it was an actual person making those noises, not some static noise. The person never gave a verbal response to anything we asked, so my dad hung up. Not even a few seconds later, the number called again. Guess what? The same thing happened. Could brother be in danger? I asked after my dad hung up. Maybe he called for help but couldn't speak. A bit worried by my theory, my dad dialed the number back, but the person had already turned their phone off by the time. The entire thing happened within only five minutes. Within the five minutes. The person called my mom three times and my dad two times, then turned their phone off. Well, my parents called my brother and made sure he was perfectly safe and sound, I looked the number up and it turned out. The number isn't international, but a local number. The number is from the city I am currently living in. We'll call it City A. So a person in City A was trying to disguise as an international number. This is intriguing and terrifying because when someone wants to hide their location, the reason can't be good. Also, we just moved to City A only a month ago. We don't have any friends or family here, so we couldn't think of anyone in City A who'd do this. We eliminated the possibility of phone fraud dialing random numbers because this person has both my parents' numbers, and at least knows that the owners of these two numbers which are my parents, are related in some way. Why and how else would the person dial my dad's number right after calling my mom? Although we didn't feel physically threatened, it was very unsettling nevertheless. We sat down and started brainstorming together, trying to figure out who would and can do this. And one person came to mind, a personal trainer at the gym. My family and I try to go to the gym every evening, so the person we looked up when we moved to City A was the gym. City A isn't a very well-developed city, and we were living in an even less developed part of the city. Luckily, there was one gym near where we lived, and it looked pretty legitimate and decent. Throughout the month, I have come to know every staff and trainer at the gym, and even some other regular gym members. Three days ago, I was at the gym using a workout machine. The machine was placed in the corner of the gym. When you exercise with it, you have to lie down facing the ground, and when you lift your head, your nose would be only a foot away from the wall. I did several reps and was resting on my belly when a pair of unfamiliar feet appeared in front of me. I stared at them for a while thinking how weird it'd be for someone to be standing there because first, this is the far corner of the gym, and second, this person would be pressing their back hard on the wall to avoid shoving their crotch in my face. A bit annoyed, I took out one of my headphones and stood up. I was instantly repelled by how uncomfortably close this man's face was to mine. I backed up a little out of instinct. He was smiling super awkwardly and did a tiny, cartoony wave at me. The uniform he was in indicated that he's a personal trainer, but I've never seen him before. Perhaps he's a new guy, I thought. Maybe he's just trying to meet potential clients, but just socializes awkwardly. So out of manner, I said hi back. Your poses are excellent. Have you been professionally trained? He asked. I laughed bitterly, but politely. <laughs> Thank you, and no. Well, would you like to try one of our training sessions with me? He said. It was then I realized how strangely he blinks. He blinks just a little too frequently, too quickly, and too forcefully. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you anything. It's all free, I promise. Keep in mind that he was still standing very close to me between the wall and the machine. I kept on smiling politely and said, I don't think I need it, but thanks. Usually, with other trainers, conversations would end here. If I put back my headphones, indicating that I'd like to continue with my workout, but he showed no sign of leaving. I can't exercise with his crotch in my face. I took out the headphones again and stared at him with a what else do you want look. Can I at least get a name please? I'm Dominic, he said. A bit annoyed, but still trying to be polite, I gave him my name. 
I mean, he works here. At least he's not some psychopath, right? Wrong. Since it looked like he was not going to leave, I laughed awkwardly and left to use other machines and put this entire ordeal into the back of my mind. The next day, I was walking on the treadmill when my phone pinged. It was a message. Hey, it's Dom. It took me a few seconds to remember who he was. I rolled my eyes. Dominic must have looked up my name in the gym's member info and found my number. Other trainers have done this too. As much as I don't appreciate what they do, I still let it slide. It's not something you can complain or report about because things like this are very common in City A, or rather in that country. Privacy is just not a thing there. Complaining would only make you the annoying one. I ignored the text, flipped my screen over, and started jogging on the treadmill. The treadmills are placed in front of a giant mirror wall. By chance, I glanced up at the mirror and saw Dominic standing motionlessly, like a statue across the gym. I could feel his eyes fixated on either my back or my reflection in the mirror. I looked away immediately and felt cold sweat gushing out from my back. My breath and heartbeat quickened almost instantly. I wasn't sure if it was because of the jogging or because of how unsettling the whole thing felt. After adjusting my breath, I looked up again. He was right behind me. Hi, he said, almost nonchalantly. Um, hi? I made sure I sounded very upset in my tone. Why are you running on the treadmill? He asked. Baffled and annoyed, I said. Uh, why can't I? You're at the gym. You should use more machines, he said. Um, none of your business. I screamed internally. Instead, still trying to be polite, I said. I'm just warming up. I'll go exercise on the machines later. Okay, he said with an understanding tone. I turned around and resumed jogging while he continued to stand behind me and stare at me in the mirror. I hit the stop button and turned around, this time sounding almost livid. I said, I'm sorry, but I'd prefer to not be watched when I jog. He stared at me for a few seconds, long enough to make me feel a bit sorry, but too short for me to do anything. Oh, okay, he said, sounding hurt, and just walked away. And that was it for the night. The next day, I was in the yoga room doing yoga with some other gym members. Only five minutes after we started, Dominic opened the door and started snapping photos of us with his phone. This shouldn't be weird because gym staffs do this all the time so they can use photos like these for their weekly newsletters. That was why nobody else felt alarmed. However, I've never seen trainers taking photos for the newsletters. It's usually the manager's job. Maybe the manager was busy and sent him to take photos today, I thought. Sometimes the manager does send other staff to take photos, but never a trainer. Just as I was caught in my thought, the manager came in, took some photos as usual, then left. I froze on my yoga mat, completely perplexed. After yoga, I went to shower and realized I have left my locker key in the yoga room. I went back to find my key. The lights were off and I didn't bother turning them on. As I was looking, I heard the heavy door creaking open. I looked up and saw a silhouette. I asked, Hello? May I help you? Then I registered the silhouette as Dominic's. He said my name. My full name. Something about that just made me go into full panic mode. He started walking to the room towards me with his mouth slightly open, about to say something. Screw being polite, I thought. I dodged and ran out of the room. That night I was watching TV on the couch with my parents and it was then my mother's phone rang and came the series of mysterious phone calls. I told my parents about Dominic. It has to be him who's making the calls, mom said. He can easily find both your dad's and my numbers from the gym info if he could find yours. That's why he disguised his number as an international call. Besides, trainers usually have a work phone and a personal phone. You can do this very easily without being recognized. It's just a guess. I mean, we can't prove if it's really him, I said. Who else would do this then? Dad's son. We just moved here. I cannot think of anyone who has access to both your mom and my number that would do this. But why? Why is he doing this? What does he get out of calling mom three times and then calling you twice and turning his phone off? I asked. What are his motives? God knows what goes on in a perv's mind like his. Mom rolled her eyes. To simply terrify you, I guess. I stopped going to the gym and the number never called again. What do you think? Was it him? If so, what could his motives have been?